Closed captioning has been enabled. I don't want to start until perhaps I, I should make sure that I'm seeing the closed captioning, make sure that this is accessible. I am seeing the closed captioning. Excellent. <laughs> and it's on in the room as well, Brian. So I think we're, um, we're good to go. Well, we're we're scheduled to uh, to begin here um, right now. <laughs> So uh, might as well uh, get going. Oh, I see you all. Excellent. Hello. Can you hear us, uh, Brian? This session is titled Reducing Disparate Outcomes with Digital Health Tools. What we're uh, in, in on the website <clears throat> for, uh, for, for IGF 2022, you'll find a more detailed uh, uh, description with expected outcomes, but this session, uh, generally, just to give a little bit of an introduction here, is about is about the use of digital health tools, and I do mean that that widely, uh, in providing greater access to high quality healthcare and resources, uh, particularly for those in rural, lower income, less educated, and and other underserved or unserved populations uh, who are experiencing lower care quality, um, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, which has in some ways accelerated the uptake of, well, digitization generally, but the uptake of digital health tools in a range of use cases in, in the healthcare sector in particular. Uh, there's very, I, I, I'm sure, uh, I, I think we're looking to explore the, the, the experiences uh, in, in light of that and, and, and lessons learned. Uh, we now have more than two years of, of data, data and experiences and, uh, and what conclusions can, can we draw and how can we build on those? Um, and, and what role does the IGF community have in sustaining the enhanced digitization, um, uh, what policies can and should sustain themselves beyond the pandemic, uh, how, what's been affected, what hasn't, et cetera. So the, the, that, that's, uh, that's the goal in a nutshell of this session here. And, um, uh, you can see it just I should quickly review the expected outcomes here, which again, these are included in the public uh, publicly available listing for the session. but but we're looking to first help folks understand the spectrum of opportunities and challenges that digital health tools are bringing to communities, how uh, and 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 the interplay with um, uh, socioeconomic factors and social determinants of health. Uh, second, looking to do something of a landscape, evaluation survey, uh, draw some conclusions about the use of digital health tools and services during the pandemic. Third, learn about, explore what the IGF community can do to uh, to, be to best realize the, the and, and maintain the potential uh, uh, for, for digital health, augmenting the continual care. Uh, uh, as ideally the pandemic does indeed uh, wind down and hopefully end forever. And uh, and lastly, to share some diverse perspectives about the path forward. So uh, again, I'm my name is Brian Scarpelli. I'm I'm with a an organization called ACT the App Association, and and our particular interest, I could say very briefly, is the reason I'm so excited that to be part of this panel be here with these expert uh, panelists and you all in the IGF community is that the App Association has a dedicated initiative to uh, 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 advance, responsibly advancing the uptake of digital health tools and services called the Connected Health Initiative, which for, for about six or seven years now has been uh, very focused in advocating for positive governance changes um, uh, across and uh, uh, in and across key jurisdictions around the world to realize the uh, the positive power of 
uh, digital health tools. So um, we be, we very much uh, have a number. We have members, including those who are on this panel, who are are uh, I think uh, uh, really the, the the perfect people to speak to this very very important challenge slash opportunity. It really is both of those things. Um, very briefly, I can just I'll just very briefly uh, mention who the, <laughs> our panelists are. I think uh, it would be excellent um, to defer to um, each of you panelists to introduce yourself and, 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 uh, further, uh, your organization, your experience, where you're coming from. That would really help frame things up, I think, in your opening remarks. Uh, but uh, our, our expected uh, format here today is to I'll have each of our expert panelists uh, do exactly that, introduce themselves, provide some opening framings, perspectives, remarks, and uh, and then we have lots of questions. I have lots of questions uh, to ask, but ideally um, we'll have engagement and interventions and questions from you in the IGF community, uh, be it the, the people in the room, or uh, the growing number of uh, participants that I'm seeing uh, already, which is great, um, uh, on uh, participating virtually. Uh, so um, there's a chat. As uh, as Matt has, uh, my colleague, by the way, Matt, Matt Schwartz is in the room. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, it has noted in the chat, there is not a Q&A function, there's just the chat. So if you are participating virtually, please do uh, put your questions, comments, anything else into the chat. And uh, we'd love to ensure that that you're uh, fully participating. So uh, the panelists we have here, uh, Svetislav Vizitu, Elena Melanina, and Betsy Furler are all... Um, I think, uh, there, it, I, like I, I mentioned, uh, not to too much in anticipation here, build up on my part, but I think all have very unique and uh, and and um, and important perspectives and experiences from where they sit. So I guess uh, if it's okay, uh, Svetislav, I'd love to turn it over to you to start uh, to provide some opening remarks and and introduce yourself, and then. Lena and then uh, and then Betsy after that. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Svetoslav Vizitiu and I'm representing the Velo. Is the startup in uh, based in Europe in Romania, and we are helping the families with overweight and obese children. And uh, we also already signed with Minister of Education in Romania, and our program is quite good making now in uh, Romania, that meaning all the schools are uh, making uh, this fun lection, le uh, fun, uh, uh, let's say, lessons, and uh, that's what we're do doing now, is the short introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, or good afternoon to uh, everybody. My name is Yelena Malinina, and I'm data director at the European organization representing uh, patients living with rare diseases. Um, we do not work directly with patients, our members are, and we do have members in um, more than 71 European countries for the moment. Um, and rare diseases, basically, the, the, the you can find the variety of definitions of what it is, but basically it's the condition which uh, is um, more rare than um, chronic diseases, more rare than anything else we're used to. So there are quite many challenges uh, for this specific group and there is uh, not so much data available. So uh, sometimes it's just five people in one country having that condition. So uh, we do work quite a lot on um, data uses for research. Uh, we also do quite a lot of advocacy for different social um, rights um, and all kind of issues um, people of that group face. So I'm looking forward to have a discussion with you uh, today, and thank you for coming. I'm Betsy Furler. I'm from Houston, Texas in the US, and I am the founder of a software startup called For All Abilities. We work with um, employers, um, helping them help their employees with, with or without a disclosure of a disability. 
I'm also a speech therapist and have worked extensively with people of all ages and abilities. And I have a lot of lived experience in the healthcare industry, both professionally and personally. Excellent, thank you. And I see you all in the audience, hello. <laughs> Apologies for not being there in person. Um, okay, excellent. Well, I think uh, just some opening questions that I, I hope will, first of all, I'd love to hear from, from any and all of all three of you, uh, uh, of our expert panelists on this, on this, uh, on this question here, but, uh, but also I hope that this starts to provoke some thoughts uh, from the community here. Um, whether, again, whether you're in the room, whether you're participating virtually, we'd love to have you engaged and uh, and participating. And uh, if you have an intervention and or a question, please don't be shy. Uh, but this opening question, again, for uh, for 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 all of our panelists, really, um, it, it is as the public health crisis has evolved, COVID nineteen pandemic, we've seen healthcare providers adopting new digital health tools. And I, there is a wide range of terminologies used, uh, telehealth, remote monitoring solutions. But I, I guess I, I just, I would maybe capture them as both synchronous live voice video type services, as well as asynchronous um, uh, services where one is, for, for example, wearing a device that's capturing some uh, some reading, some patient-generated health data at an interval, storing it, sending it to a care team for uh, for trending and and perhaps early intervention to to avoid a, a more significant negative health episode. So as the pan and 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 I, and recognizing that COVID nineteen has not disappeared, right? It's, it, it depending on where you are, it is still considered it, or declared by a, a, a government, a public health emergency. Um, in some other instances, uh, the public health emergency legal declarations may have expired, yet even in those places, it has not gone away. So recognizing that, um, uh, you know, some of the special allowances, special funding, et cetera, from uh, in particular governments may be pulling away. So has the trend toward the, uh, has, the has the trend in uptake of, in use of digital health tools slowed in your experience where you are focused, be it in jurisdiction or region, are things back to normal or has there been has has it has, have things largely returned to a pre-pandemic approach for digital health or has there been lasting change thought that would be kind of a good I realize that's an open-ended question but but a good question hopefully for just kind of framing the rest of our discussion here anyone who wants to go first <laughs> go ahead example in Romania uh, we have like you're saying a back to normal uh, we use a lot in the pandemic and COVID uh, the tele <coughs> telemedicine <coughs> but now let's say everyone is back into normal that meaning also the doctors don't accept it to to have a telemedicine but for my opinion it's back to normal and it's <coughs> it's not okay but uh, many private sector, the good thing that they are still working on digitalization. <coughs> I'm sorry. They are still working on digitalization, but meaning they are making more software, making more access for the, uh, their patients, and uh, they're working good in that direction. That's my opinion. Uh, yeah, and I can adapt probably from um, the European perspective. Um, Indeed, we have seen a super rapid uh, change in appearance of different types of services, um, monitoring, calls, whatever, during COVID-19 times in many European countries because it was kind of necessary at that time because mm, you couldn't go to the doctor um, 
li just like that. So the, the first uh, preference was online in, in many countries. Now I, th I also share um, Stetislav's view that it's slowed down, but um, not because people don't want to use it, but because uh, we realized probably uh, some drawbacks of, um, of these services. And for instance, one of them, and it's a big question for telemedicine in Europe, how to you know, made it equ make it equal to uh, on-site services, is that people do not have the same rights when it comes to telemedicine and going for a physical uh, visit to a doctor. So for instance, if it's very, very clear in terms of reimbursement, how, how your insurance covers um, your normal visit to GP or any other specialist, in many countries, it's not really obvious what telemedicine service is and whether it will be covered by insurance. Also in the EU, there is a right to seek healthcare in another country, not the country of your residence, but another country of the European Union. Meaning, for instance, I'm residing in Belgium, but I can seek healthcare uh, provision also in my home country, even though I'm paying my insurance uh, in Belgium. Uh, I can go back to Lithuania, where I come from, and be reimbursed by the Belgian system. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, again, for um, GP visit, for instance, if I want to uh, seek the reimbursement. Usually it's not GP service, but it will be a specialist care, wi wi for which I seek in another country. But in case of telemedicine, the thing is that in some countries it will be recognized equally to, to the same physical visit, and in some it doesn't. So it creates a big legal mess, um, and it's not always clear also in terms of liability, because in some countries the um, doctors or healthcare professionals such as nutritionists, it, it can be different classifications. So in one country it will be um, classified as a doctor, in some it won't be. So it, it, re it also really, really depends. And all these legal questions, they are not harmonized. And this is one of the reasons as well why this uh, service is slowed down, because there is no rapid need. And now there is a big, big need also to find out how do we regulate it uh, and what rights do we provide to people when it comes to um, telemedicine. And it's not an easy uh, question to find an answer to, I must say. Thanks. I would say um, specifically in Houston, Texas and um, probably across the U.S., telemedicine is now used more than it ever was before. Um, you know, pre pre pandemic, um, it's lessened since the pandemic has kind of started fading away a bit. Um, but if we're looking at pre COVID and now, definitely there's a lot more use of telemedicine, and I think it does really level the playing field in some ways for some patients, especially those patients with the rare or more severe diseases where they might need a very specialized subspecialist that may be far away from their residence. Specifically in Houston, Texas, we have severe traffic and it's a very, very large city. And a lot of um, times patients aren't able to physically get to the location of the doctor that they want to see. So telemedicine has really opened that up and it is still being used pretty frequently, I would say, um, in Houston. although. A lot of people are going back to in-person visits. Um, in the speech therapy and therapy industry, it's also being used a very, very heavily, and I think that's really opened up so many opportunities for people to get to the special therapies that they need to get to, which they often attend at least weekly or maybe several times a week, um, and it really cuts down on the amount of time each of those appointments take when you don't have to factor in an hour or two of traffic. And Brian, uh, I'd like to ask you, actually, you've been tracking it very closely in the US. Mm -hmm. There's already talk of the public health emergency maybe uh, winding down in mm -hmm. the next couple of, of months. Um, what risks do you see there in terms of uh, well, uptake? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Matt. And, and I'd, uh, I can, I can brief, just a, as a brief snapshot, of the, the approach for for the United United States has been essentially that um, indeed the government has declared a public health emergency, it, it, capital P, capital H, capital E, 
uh, which has been in in place for over two years at this point. And uh, the significance of that legal declaration has been to uh, that is that it it permits uh, the government to set aside a wide range of legacy legal requirements that have long restricted the uptake and use of different digital health modalities. And as time has gone on, even before the pandemic, I have argued and many of those restrictions have, have, in, have had less and less of a connection to um, serving the public interest. We're talking about some restrictions that go back 25 years, you know, um, it's just uh, uh, quite a task for the, the the legislature in the in the United States to update update the laws um, uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, uh, so enjoying that flexibility has now been something that <clears throat> patients, providers, um, innovators across the the the, the, the spectrum, ha and 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 policy and, and government the government have been able to enjoy now for two and a half years. So. There's been there's an immense amount of uptake, but there's a real danger that eventually the public health emergency declaration will end, um, and that many of these legacy policies that have long significantly hampered the uptake and use of digital health tools will snap back into place. Um, causing some, someone in a rural area, for example, to who for the last two and a half years has not had to drive two, maybe three or hours or, or even longer to see a specialist uh, because they've been able to receive the care they need, you know, receive the care they need and, and, and undertake the consultations they need to take via digital, uh, via just a, even basic tools, like a live call, voice, video and voice interaction like like I'm having with you all right now um that 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 capability would be removed for anyone who um lives in an urban or suburban area per se which is which is quite concerning so that 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 is one use case um uh, you know and uh and and we came actually quite close to the end of this legal declaration, the public health emergency declaration. Uh, but uh, it is, it's likely to be extended through, you know, basically early April at the very latest at this point. So very, very relevant questions for the, for the, for the U.S. Uh, jurisdiction, for sure. I appreciate you asking me that, <laughs> Matt. Um, I think, uh, you know, so Another related question, and again, I'd love, I, I think it'd be great to hear from each of the panelists, though, is that, you know, one of the, I, I guess to frame it this way, is there's uptake, and then there's a separate but very related question, uh, or access, access and uptake of new services and tools, and then a, a different but related question of quality, of quality of care. And one criticism that I have seen uh, with enhanced access to digital health tools from some, this is not a view. And by the way, I should I actually, I'd just be, I'll be forthright and say, it's, it's really not a view that I largely share personally, but it is um, part of the conversation. So it's probably worth teeing up is that in, that the rapid increase in access to digital health tools and services has not necessarily brought with it enhanced quality of care. Um, and uh, like I said, I I I I, uh, I tend to to large to generally disagree with that. In inevitably, there there probably may be maybe uh, interactions that don't reflect an enhanced quality of care through digital modality. I think that's inevitable, but, but why generally uh, I, I'm curious though, what, you know, 
what what your all's view on that is. Um, do you have concerns, et cetera, with quality of care in this new, far more digitally enhanced and connected continuum that's been brought about relatively rapidly due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Again, whoever, whoever would like to go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, I see um, some issues, especially around um, forced use of digital health care in some situations and difficulty with people with a variety of disabilities or challenges being able to access that care. Um, for instance, I know of a case where a, a elderly person was required to do a telehealth visit versus an in-person visit. But yet the connection, there are a variety of different reasons, um, some relating to just the internet connection in and of itself, and then also the access to the technology can be confusing, um, really you know, decrease their ability to be able to participate in the, in the visit like they may have been able to in person. I think overall though that the quality of care is um, pretty equal depending on the specialty you're looking at, but um, often we, we have appointments that are, you know, face to face, but um, they're, it's just a conversation that can easily be done um, via telehealth. Um, also, um, being able to share information or data that's collected um, can sometimes be done more efficiently and easier, e more easily. And um, often it seems that the level of stress, both on the provider and the patient, may be lessened when it is through um, digital health versus in person and rushed and um, problems with traffic, as I said earlier. So I think, I, I do think the quality of care is, is adequate. Um, specifically in the therapy industry, I think for mental health therapy services in particular, telehealth has been very helpful for many people who couldn't get to appointments before. And it also provides some anonymity so people are not having to walk into a building and be seen in that building. Um, for other patients, they may need to go somewhere because their home is not a safe place for them to talk about their mental health needs. In the rehab therapy industry, such as speech therapy, it has opened up um, providers to people who have not had access, whether they're in a rural area or a part of the city where they can't access a, the private you know, a clinic or an office building. And it has really opened up that. Um, and with all of the amazing tools that we now have on the web and we have access to, Therapy can be even more exciting, and to many people, especially children, they're very attracted to the screen, and it helps them be able to participate. It also helps in some situations, although there are a lot of legal issues around um, licensing and things like that, but um, providers, if they have licenses in other states, if someone moves in the U.S., um, they can continue to see the same provider and depending on you know all of their reimbursement issues and like I said licensing and also that helps with um, continuity of care even when someone lives in a moves to another country yes also I want to add that <coughs> Between them, uh, they're quite similar now with telemedicine and normal appointments. In my opinion, there are benefits, for example, when you want to reduce the time also in the hospitals, also the time, let's say 90% of the ambulances when they come, they come for nothing because uh, many guys, uh, like people are accessing because they are shocked or they don't know what to do. And maybe in this direction, telemedicine also will help and reduce the 
real problems in the uh, hospitals and it uh, can happen. But uh, also for my personal, I used telemedicine in the COVID and it's quite good because like I don't want to lose one hour or two hours just only to arrive to the hospital, <laughs> not only wait on the hospital. And this is quite very good. And sometimes it's really just simple checkpoint. And uh, if you're feeling that is need next level, then you can go in the real life and to check with a doctor or with uh, some person. And I, like you also said, the nutritionals in many countries are just simple, uh, let's say normal uh, advising, but in many they're just medical. I'll try to uh, answer to this question a little bit wider, um, not only focusing on telemedicine, but also bringing up the quality of digital tools we use. Um, there is actually an interesting study which compares um, online uh, psychotherapy effectiveness uh, to in-person psychotherapy, and it's equal. Uh, so the effectiveness of um, online or in-person uh, mental health services are exactly the same. And there, there have been some studies done, so it's, um, it also contributes to the opinion that these services, in fact, telemedicine could be as effective, as efficient as in person. Of course, uh, probably we're not speaking about surgery or some you know, serious, uh, more serious interventions in that regard yet, at least for the next years to come, but who knows what, what the future will be. Um, I think, yes, yeah, so it has a lot of potential and um, I have a patient story actually, which is, I wish it would be different, but how uh, in that sense, um, digital health tools could be helpful. So the person has a rare condition and he uh, was hospitalized uh, very urgently while he was on holidays in Italy. And originally he comes from Denmark. Um, he has a um, condition for his entire life, so he perfectly knows what is happening to him and uh, he has like a lot of data about him, all the needed uh, tests and everything. But while he was on, on vacation, uh, his Danish uh, records were not easily available to him, so all the tests he did quite recently, just before doing his trip, were held in the hospital in Denmark. And uh, due to the fact that the systems of uh, Italy and Denmark were not really interoperable, they were not speaking well with each other, he lost um, quite a lot of days um, when it comes to uh, receiving uh, the right care simply because the doctors in Italy did not know much about his condition since it's rare and they did not receive the data in time since they needed to repeat all the tests. So if we are speaking, you know, about the tool which allows you to have electronic health record, for instance, which allows to, to have your data with you and share it uh, not only within your specific healthcare provider, but somewhere else, it would save him enormous amounts of time. Also, it would save him from complications which occur to his health, obviously, because of the delay. Um, and yes, I hope in the, in the years to come we will have more success stories like that. Uh, another aspect which I would like to touch is, is the quality of different digital health tools. Um, and perhaps, you know, depending on the region and the country uh, you come from, this quality could be very different and there can be different assessment tools. But if we just go on the Google Play and see um, how many well-being apps exist <laughs> and how many you can download, and the question is, are they equally good? And I'm sure some of them will be fantastic. And some, for instance, medical devices, which are software based, are really, really cool. And uh, they're getting even reimbursed by, by the governments because they, they, their efficiency is proven to be helpful for one or another condition. But the enormous amount of different types of software which occurs to health and well-being, um, it raises the question whether it's good in terms of quality, whether the advice this device gives you or an app gives you is equally good. Um, and probably the answer is no, <laughs> because uh, they are very, very rarely evaluated by somebody. And, you know, they are um, even trustworthiness is questioned. Brian, I wanted to um, just piggyback on what she said about the interoperability. The, it's a, what I, cons I consider to be a severe problem in the United States, because we have um, it sounds like we have less interoperability state by state in the U.S. than Europe has from country to country. Um, 
And even um, within the U.S., for instance, in Houston, within one um, healthcare system and the other, there is no interoperability. And so if a patient is, has to be hospitalized at uh, a hospital down the street, literally, um, just a few blocks from their, their typical hospital, and I also have a patient story about this um, with a patient that was having had to be hospitalized at a different hospital because of space, um, no beds at the hospital that they normally went to. They were impatient and they would not they were not able the doctors were not able to get the records from the hospital down the street, and therefore the tests had to be rerun. Um, you know, making a, a financial burden. Um, a burden of time, um, stress on the patient, and additional time before the patient got the care they needed because of the lack of interoperability. Thank you. Well, um, I'm pleased to see that we have a, an interesting question here in the chat, and I can just read it. I would love to see what the see what your all's reaction is. So here goes, I'll just read it. We propose to create remote medical clinics in hard to reach places. Such clinics can function on the basis of satellite internet, drones, and solar panels as power sources. Such a clinic could be equipped with appropriate diagnostic equipment. Initially with little effort, it would be possible to take pictures of the patient in remote clinics, collect blood and urine samples, uh, pictures of the patient or specific parts of their body, blood, uh, uh, samples collected could be sent by drone to larger medical clinics and be the basis for diagnosing certain diseases, issuing prescriptions, and sending medicines to the remote clinic, again, by drone. Is that possible? That's the question. What do you all think? I think yes, because we're already doing, because already exist many startups that with IE detecting, for example, some screening uh, photos also about the diseases, uh, anything. But my opinion is quite easy to make it now in this 20, 2022. It actually reminds me of um, a project which I was part of in, in my previous job. It was a project done in Georgia by UN and WHO. Uh, about bringing telemedicine to remote areas of Georgia. Um, because of the geographical uh, location, they, it's very mountainous area, so sometimes it's very, very difficult even to reach uh, with the helicopter. Some areas the helicopter cannot land, but people do live there, and of course they, they require um, healthcare. Um, and the idea was also to uh, connect these uh, smaller villages into, into the hospital. And the issues we actually faced were was not a technology itself. It, it, these were more basic things, such as electricity and access to continuous electricity. And even with solar panels, um, it depends, of course, on, on the location. Um, in some countries, probably in sunny countries, this would work perfectly. But I was two weeks ago in Nepal, uh, in, in, in Himalayas, uh, for, for my holidays. And when I was high up, uh, we basically, so, so the um, houses there where we were staying, uh, they had solar panels, but the thing is that we only could use, uh, for instance, uh, the, the lights during the evening and the charger for the phone during the day, because electricity uh, panels were, ch uh, solar panels were charged enough with, with the energy just for the day because of lack of sun. And it could also probably depend, you know, on the length of the day, because if we are speaking about uh, north uh, then now <laughs> the, the the day is pretty short so it, usually you know it comes back to to some super basic problems which are not easy to solve but it is I, I believe it is possible yes great <laughs> thank um, you i i agree <laughs> <laughs> sorry betsy <laughs> go ahead Oh, I don't have anything to add. I just agree. Oh, got it. Sorry. I, I just agree <laughs> to what they have to say. I think I think it would be wonderful um, okay. to to pull off something like that, and and probably be helpful in all countries, including the U.S. There are places that uh, that aren't getting healthcare at the moment. Indeed. All right. Great. Well. Um, 
thanks for that uh, 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 question, Henrik. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so I guess I could, I could switch to maybe some some targeted questions here that that I had for for some of you for some of the panelists here. Um, maybe maybe uh, Svetislav, uh, can you talk a little bit about Wello's approach to digital health and nutrition and the problem you're working to solve, obstacles you've experienced in 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 uh, bringing bringing Wello to um, to uh, to a, a broader um, uh, patient base, et cetera? Yeah, sure. Uh, it started like a couple of years ago with my personal per problem. I have be more overweight, like <laughs> even more wider than now. And uh, from this point, I also have a family and uh, the statistics are saying if you have a one parent uh, overweight or obese, then the children can 40% be overweight or obese. If two, then that meaning is can over 70% can be, be overweight or obese. And because we was we were we are IT company, uh, and we are developing a lot of games gamifications, and we started to make a gamif gamification for the children, and uh, it's quite cool because uh, children are playing like uh, games. They have uh, challenges every day, and these challenges are activity challenges like to run, to walk, to jump, and so on and some games, just games simple to learn about healthy plate, how to make, go to shopping and so on. And the amazing part, if they are doing this one, the parent can set up also the real rewards in their life. And if they do these challenges, they are uh, receiving a ticket to cinema or bicycle and so on. And uh, when they are doing these challenges, we are tracking the activities like a movement and we provide to the parents the information about tracking. And, and in that direction we know when the child is more active in the evening, in the morning and so on. And if the parents are introducing uh, information about the eating at home and at school, then we provide the special diet or nutritional plan for the family that will help to lose the weight or if not just to live more healthy. Uh, and what we saw now, the good point, that also the main points in the family are the parents. If the parents know more information about uh, nutritional, about how to make activities with the children to be more interesting, then the family started to be more healthy. And that's why we have a Wellopedia where we make some quizzes and some challenges for them, also for the parents. It's very quite good <coughs> and good progress. And now we are proud that uh, from the this year, from the September, we started the in the Romania in all the schools. We have a program in the nutrition that we are learning uh, the children about nutrition, and we have created the first nutritional um, influencer that it's like robotic girl that it was created with the children uh, between uh, ten and eighteen years, and it's like have a virtual uh, like robotic uh, leg and robotic uh, hand and uh, the most interesting thing that also the teacher don't know did, didn't don't know didn't know to know the nutritional they just can play this video and in this video you are learning after you make a quizzes and you're drawing and so on and the results are amazing we already uh, do research paper like uh, children are absorbing information better with 40% than with normal teachers. In my opinion, it's very cool. Uh, yes, this is a short description of what we are doing uh, with we Wello, and res results are very good now. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> okay, well, uh, another thread within the space um, I think, um, and th this is a question for you, uh, Elena, um, some have raised concerns about the potential for additional privacy and cyber-based security threats when the, in light with of increased provision of certain health services that would normally be transacted on an in-person basis now occurring over a digital modality over the internet. Um, in fact, uh, sadly, we've 
I, I think uh, uh, one development that that many many uh, is 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 probably generally known and elsewhere outside of the U.S. is a recent court ruling with uh, related to uh, reproductive health and access to reproductive health for women, um, which has uh, really brought those concerns to the fore. And I'm curious about whether uh what 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 the what what your take on on this particular question is in light of that decision uh and and your experience in europe and and uh if you have any recommendations about how patient how to ensure that patients can retain strong privacy and security assurances uh as more and more care moves to uh virtual online Thank you. That that's a very important question, actually. And you know, unfortunately, we still have a mentality that these things happen uh, either in science fiction movies or not to us. But in fact, uh, privacy risks and uh, security risks and also informational harm risks are super high for each of us. And uh, what happened in the U.S. actually is the uh, perfect and sad example of how um, this can cause damage. Um, I must say. In the EU as a totality, some countries are super advanced with um, electronic health information, but some are not really. So there, there will be a lot of uh, changes in the upcoming years because there is a general direction of that we are all moving into uh, digital um, healthcare in a way. And these risks are will, will be getting higher and higher. For instance, with the establishment of electronic health record in Europe, um, the question is whether I should, for instance, I go to the dentist, right? And uh, that's a healthcare professional in, in most of the countries. And the question is, should I share my all my electronic health record with the dentist? Meaning that it can be some sensitive information about uh, mental health or for women it can be an abortion, for instance, which uh, she did. And whether she wants, uh, or a patient or anybody wants to share it with, with their dentist and you know, probably not. But then the question is, how do we organize the um, the data storage, especially when it comes to personal health records, in such a way that the the patient can share certain things with certain doctors and maybe withhold certain information. Um, and it's really a difficult, difficult question to answer because, uh, of course, situation with the dentist or if you go to the pharmacist to you know to for e prescription, these situations are quite straightforward. But in some situations, patients might withhold an information which is vital for them. And some might not have a good assessment of what is in for to share and what is the in for to withhold. So there is a thin line between you know, privacy and uh, health needs in there. Um, but I think the answer to this is that we should have a um, sufficient system which is protective of us because it's not only about uh, privacy or security, there is a huge risk also of uh, informational harm. It can be uh, discrimination as well, and this discrimination can occur even even without uh, a person knowing that it occurred. So the certain decision might, might be made based on, on the certain data or patterns, and you would not even know. And for instance, in case of rare disease community, most of the rare diseases are of genetic origin, so the data is uh, even more sensitive, which is uh, used, and it affects not only one person, but it affects the entire family, potentially future generations. So the question is how do we treat that data and what safeguards do we put to ensure that these things do not happen? And another super important thing, and I think we're not speaking enough about that, is the cybersecurity um, schemes in the hospitals and in the healthcare settings, because uh, the, the cyber attacks on the hospitals are happening weekly, actually worldwide. And it causes enormous uh, financial burden to the hospital because sometimes uh, they, they cannot function for some weeks properly, especially if their um, electronic system um, is really, really developed, there is not that much paper left, or they are dependent you know, on, on certain like computer and databases installed in there. And also it can cause quite a big harm to patients' health. And there is a story which happened some months ago in Germany when the, there was an attack on, on the hospital and um, the patient who, who was in the ambulance at that moment uh, was reverted to another hospital because the, another one, the closest one was blocked by the cyber attack and she died. 
Um, so it's not, you know, an exact cause probably of the cyber attack, but the fact that, you know, the nearest hospital was not available uh, available and could have saved that person's life. Yeah, probably, you know, only that one story is worth an investment in, um, in good cybersecurity for healthcare settings. Thank you. <coughs> um, Betsy, if I could uh, turn to you, uh, turn to you for the, the next question. I know yesterday for another session we were <laughs> part of together, we chatted about the need to make sure communities with different uh, uh, abilities are able to access uh, particular digital health tools. So I know you've spoken to this a little bit, but but uh, you know, if, if you did want, I wondered if you wanted to talk some further in some further detail about the impediments you've seen uh, with the uptake of digital health tools for, for those communities. I know we've mentioned already several layers. Um, some seem to be infrastructure-based, broadband availability. Uh, then there's maybe the layer of data flows you mentioned brief, uh, briefly earlier. That's That was seemed like a very important one. And another one that I think has come up at least once already maybe has been digital literacy. There's probably other barriers too, right? Uh, but I, I was just curious about, you know, what, what do you think there? Um, well, first of all, digital health tools, just like all digital tools, need to be made so they're accessible to all people. Um, and people with disabilities are often the group that gets left out of the conversation about that. Um, whether it's from a design perspective um, or it's from a, a physical access perspective, that accessibility of these tools is, is vital, um, maybe more than any of the other digital tools because it's your, it's your health and your life that is at stake here. Um, I think it, it also is um, the digital literacy issue around some of the people who need health care the most and are the bigger use, biggest users of health care are the people who struggle the most with digital literacy, whether they're our aging population or um, people with disabilities who haven't had the access to learning about um, you know, learning their digital literacy um, due to le less of access to those type of devices um, or they're um, people who haven't had um, experience due to economic struggles. So I think that the digital literacy is very vital in this because those are the people who need that medical care the most and they're impacted by it the most as well. It also goes to um, how is someone gonna communicate um, through the digital tools if it's a, if it's a, um, a Zoom or a, a telehealth video conference type appointment, um, do they have access to captioning or sign language interpretation that they might have in person if they went to the hospital or a clinic, but that may not be easily accessed or thought of during the you know, making of the appointment? If there's someone who's nonverbal who is using a computer or a tablet type device to speak for them, is that able to be heard over the, the, the device? Hearing impairments also come into issue there, especially um, hearing impairments where the person is does not sign, so signing may not help be helpful for them, um, but they, for instance, an, someone who is, uh, who is older who's using hearing aids and then there's then there's a, another layer of complexity around the tool because the hearing aid has to be connected to the, the device that they're using for the appointment, otherwise they may not be able to hear the physician. So there, there are lots of issues. I think it's so important to think about this um, disability access um, problem or need when we're thinking about healthcare. And by making the products very accessible thinking about disability, it also makes it very accessible for all the rest of us because we all have our own um, patterns and changes throughout our lives that make especially cognitive accessibility very, very important. For instance, we're, or I'm jet lagged, um, I'm nine hours different, and I know Brian is like 
it's three o'clock in the morning or something, um, and and being tired, not getting enough sleep, automatically makes us less able to cognitively um, work through any problems. And and often tech is one of those things that when we're, we're just simply tired, we have difficulty with. If we're ill, we often have more cognitive issues. Someone with existing cognitive issues, they'll be greatly exacerbated when they're sick. Um, even though of a, those of us who, who don't have those issues on a daily basis, if we're sick, we have COVID, the flu, even a cold or um, some other simple illness, it may be much more difficult for us to access the, the digital tools due to the cognitive accessibility. Great, thank you. Well, uh, just looking at our time here, I thought I, and, and Matt and I have been keeping an eye on the chat here. I don't think that there's any uh, further interventions. Um, looking, uh, there's a maybe a final question for each of the panelists here and food for thought for the, audi uh, uh, the, the IGF community, the audience that's participating both in the room and virtually as well. Um, uh, but um, looking towards solutions, looking towards next steps, if you were able to wave a magic wand, <laughs> what's what's one or several changes? Um, and 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 they can be at they can be technology based, uh, they can be policy based, uh, whatever you like. But what what what's one or several changes that you would like to see that would make the most meaningful advances in helping? underserved and unserved patients better uh, harness uh, the potential of digital health to improve their out, the out, their outcomes. For me, for me personally, like innovation, like a startup, it will help like uh, data will be centralized. That meaning, for example, at least in Europe, I understand that it's already working and saying something. And if it will come, then exactly like, like uh, cases like this one, when you go to one of our countries, when you go to one of our hospital, also, I don't know, I'm not paper guy, <laughs> and I'm losing all papers. <laughs> for me, everything electronic would be most amazing. Also for me, like a startup, when I can read something, for example, about the children, about the family that have some issues, I don't know, maybe some allergies, that would help a lot also about the diets. And from my perspective, it will be the best scenario if we will have the common database. Okay, I agree very about the security and privacy. If uh, user or family is agreeable to share it, then you can use it and in some limits, let's say. And uh, but this database, I'm pretty sure it's about the policy. Without any policy of the government, it will be never happen. And each government, it's quite different, difficult, let's say, it. <laughs> and uh, it can be started, with, for example, in Europe, by Europe, because the European Union, and after with the biggest states, and after more smaller countries and more difficult countries that can be accessed. This is my dream, and it will be cool to have it. It might come true, actually, in the <laughs> upcoming years, because that's, that's the plan, actually, to share health data um, as much as possible for uh, different purposes, but also in a safe way. Um, for me, actually, the more I think about, you know, what would be one thing if I pick of all is I would put an emphasis on actually on digital health literacy. And um, I will explain you why, because, of course, there are many things which are needed to be done from the legal perspective, from policy perspective. But this is just, you know, mm, a theory uh, if it's not implemented properly. And in order to implement it properly and also to construct it properly, uh, all of us, and I'm not speaking only about patients or doctors, uh, literally every person, uh, depending on where you work, if you're a policymaker, if you're a researcher, doesn't matter. We all still have a lot to catch up on uh, uh, what um, digital health literacy and digital skills are, because the understanding is very limited still. And even you know within the scope of this conference, uh, and this conference is for you know 
digital, for internet, for the governance, um, how often do we speak about digital rights compared to the human rights, even though these are interlinked? Do we speak about that in schools? Maybe in some, yes, but I think we are still, you know, to me, like we are, we, we made a tremendous shift as a humanity from uh, non-digital to digital, but our mentality didn't shift. So I think a lot of problems will be solved and a lot of uh, positive things can come out of technology the moment we start you know, taking digitalization together with uh, raising our own capacity. And to me, this is the key, and it's actually um, not easily achievable, I would say, not immediately, but I hope it will be soon. <laughs> Thanks. And I'll just follow up with, I, I like both of their answers also, and um, then also the kind of big picture that we have to have access to the internet in order to use these tools and how important it is to get access to all people everywhere um, in order for them to be able to have the digital literacy and also access the tools that they need for healthcare. Well, excellent. Uh, thank you all for this and th thanks to the IGF uh, for having uh, have, uh, hosting this discussion and, and to, to everyone in the community for, for being here participating. Uh, it's, it's such an important topic, I think, for IGF to, to keep at the fore. And um, I really encourage everyone to get as engaged as they can at their local, regional, and at the IGF level. Um, uh, can't think of a more critical use case for improved uh, for Im for Im improved uh, uh, digital health. Uh, I I'm sorry for for improved uh, digital infrastructure literacy uh, uh, in data flow. I mean at all the different levels uh, uh, than than the healthcare sector. So uh, very important discussion, and and I'm honored to be a part of it again that's the, I hope I hope everyone has an idea if you didn't already about why we're why I'm so excited about this topic so appreciate the expertise from from uh from all of our panelists thank you all so much as uh as next steps uh I know that that there will be a, a post panel report for this work session like there is for for the others, and uh, and and uh, and we, I, I encourage you to reach out to Matt and myself if if uh, if uh, if if the App Association and, and our Connected Health Initiative can, in any shape or form, uh, uh, support uh, su help you or or support you uh, there, and 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 uh, not to speak for our panelists, but I would I would encourage you to. <laughs> to reach out to each of them for the same, because we're all uh, very enthusiastic uh, about the, the, the realizing the, the, the true potential of digital health uh, tools and services across use cases. With that, I, I suppose uh, we should close uh, this work session. Thank you all um, again, and have a good rest of your IGF 2022.